um, use different kind of terminology. Um, we, we distinguish in talking about, let's see, relations of ideas and material matters of fact between formal truths and factual truths. Okay? Formal just having the logical form of. Well, um, what is a priori for Kant is just formal principles that give rational form to things rather than factual concepts that tell you about things. So the a priori concepts by themselves tell you nothing. They affirm nothing. They're just formal principles that help you to, that help you, that automatically seem to order, structure your thinking. Certainly. And cause and effect is going to be one of those principles. And as I said, there are 11 others. Um, all right, Copernican Revolution. Yeah, um, Kant tells us that um, this represents a new Copernican Revolution. Now, you're familiar with the first one. Copernicus who changed our way of thinking about the universe from geocentric to heliocentric. Earth at the centre to sun at the centre. Previously, we sort of looked out from where we are at the very heart of everything we survey. Now, because of uh, Copernicus, we're put out on the periphery somewhere. Uh, we're put in our place. Not quite marginalized. Uh, but we sort of recognize our place and uh, recognize that we are not at the center of things. You see. In other words, the, the angle of vision, where we're coming from, the perspective, is different. Now, philosophically, the perspective, the angle of vision in thinking about things in the Enlightenment was that of a thoroughgoing objectivity. The objectivity of all perception and knowledge. Sometimes it's be called, been called, John Dewey calls it that, the spectator theory. Knowledge is a spectator sport. You're an observer, not a participant. You don't contribute to it. You're just a recipient. You see. But the Copernican Revolution, the new Copernican Revolution, introduces subjectivity. Subjectivity in the sense that the human subject contributes. It's not all subjectivity. No, but the human subject contributes the formal structures, the a priori concepts. Yes, so in that sense, the world we know is the world as we have shaped it. Yeah. The world of cause-effect mechanisms with necessary connections and forces at work, is the world that we conceptualized. Whether or not it's the way it is, in reality, is a further question. Now, that Copernican revolution, far, far reaching, but the outcome for Kant is his distinction between phenomena and noumena. Because if what we know is the world we have structured that way, then it's just the way it appears to us. What I know is what appears to me, the way it is, the phenomena. Uh, the phenomena, which in his German terminology is the uh, ding für mich, the thing for me. 
Whereas the noumena, the reality of things, is the ding on zik, the thing in itself. And because our subjectivity structures the world in a certain way, then what we know, if we know anything, we know through that grid, through that lens. You see? We only know phenomena, not noumena. That's why his conclusion is negative about metaphysical knowledge. The very preconditions that make thinking possible are subjective preconditions. You see? Now, of course, what Leibniz and others had talked about was pre-established harmony. And if it should turn out that the structures which structure our thinking also structure the world, then we've got a corner on reality. You see, so one way that some people have tried to handle Kant is to agree that there are a priori concepts, but to maintain that um, they do indeed structure reality. And so we do have metaphysical knowledge and can do natural theology and so forth. The problem is that while Kant regarded these a priori structures as universally the same for all human beings, you don't go far in the 19th century before they become culturally relativized. That's what Max Weber did, you see, and others. So that if the a priori structures become relative to culture or whatever, then all human knowledge becomes relativized. Okay. Now, I'm inclined to think there's a third alternative, namely that um, a priori structures are not uh, logically necessary, but they are culturally, historically uh, developed, tried and proven in the course of history and in human experience, so that they have pragmatically justified themselves. You see? And you have a um, justifiable belief that things are the way they see. And that allows for all of the Copernican, all of the scientific revolutions that people like Thomas Kuhn talk about. Paradigm shifts, which is a change of the a priori grid. But you can see where Kant is leading here. Um, Okay, maybe we should leave it there. I'll pick it up at this point next time. I want to say one thing more by way of introduction, and it'll be a good way to start off, um, namely about the historical impact of this in Kant, the historical impact, and that'll tune us back into what we've been saying today before we move on from there. Okay.